this is still totally so some of you I don't know at all sort of uh or at least I know just very little and some of you I know very well and you're all mushed from totally different context on this screen so thank you all for coming and uh I'm just gonna make this super casual because um, I was changing a slide a minute and a half ago. And so this is very, very new. It's not very new material as in it's the only thing I've been obsessed with for probably three years, but it's it's uh, newly prepared to share in any kind of coherent or perhaps incoherent way with uh, anyone. So thank you all for your sort of patience in this sort of self-organizing thing. And I would, this this is all to say, this is not false modesty. It really is the first uh, go around. So I'm very deeply grateful for any feedback from you. You can also stop me if you're just like, what, what is she on about? And, I, and it's completely confusing and I haven't given you background on some concept or idea or whatever it is, I'm very happy to pause and we can get into discussion. Having said that, there's a bit of a rhythm here um, that I'd like to to try to adhere to, which is on the broadest scale, um, it's really taking us through a period over. Nicholas, I'm not sure if you can mute yourself. There's some lovely children in your background. Um, so we'll we'll try more generally to do is sort of um, go through a period of talking a little bit conceptually, and I will give you a bit of a theoretical background to um, liminal learning and some of the work that we're doing in liminal learning, which is a deliberately developmental space by all the definitions of life itself or uh, Keegan or any of those folks. Um, and then I will introduce a practice for you that we've been doing um, as part of Pilots for Liminal Learning and uh, set you up for ha having that experience. And once you've had that experience and you're sort of really m very much enmeshed in this social kind of meaning making in the present moment, we'll come back out, we'll have a general discussion about it, uh, get back to our kind of abstract uh, conceptual level and think about the frameworks that we all care about deeply and how they might be um, involved in what our experience sort of let us bring to the, uh, our concepts. And then I will get you into one more exercise and end finally with a sort of conceptual wrap up. Okay, so that's the general plan. I will keep time as well as I can. Um, so let me just jump in right now. I'm gonna need to share my screen um, and you'll see that, okay, I can't speak and look for anything there. Okay, uh, share screen totally like a newbie. I have no idea what's in the background of my screen. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is the talk and it's really around flexibility, thinking about how we can practice flexible mindsets, but also emotional and social uh, practices that lend towards flexibility and developmental, deliberately development. I'm going to just call them DDSs. Um, so a quick update, because a few of you don't know me, um, I started in undergrad as a lit major. My deep love still is um, literature and poetry and really always from then and even earlier, um, I've been interested in human the human condition and why we suffer and especially why we make each other suffer. <laughs> Um, I went into psychology as a double major because I have a Eastern European parents who would not have any of this literature brouhaha and I had to get practical. Um, but I still maintain that poetry is probably the most useful practice that I have every day, almost every day. Um, and I'd love to talk about that at the end of this uh, call for reasons I hope become obvious. Um, in grad school, I studied developmental psychology. So I'm basically trained as a developmental psychologist, mostly in cognitive science and developmental um, cognitive science, as well as complexity science, which was a big emphasis of everything that I've done from my thesis onward. And largely because everything I studied and then eventually taught was through this lens of complexity or dynamic systems theory, because all of psychology is still stuck in the kind of mechanistic worldview and statistical using statistical models that are most appropriate for these linear average kinds of um, ways of thinking about problems. And it is many of us, our contention that human behavior and our biology and so on 
um, is incompatible with this kind of framework. And so complexity science is really important for us. This actually is somehow all tied to everything else we're going to talk about soon. Um, so I climbed the academic ladder, got to full professor, got tons and tons of uh, grant money to support our work and became chair of the my department by all status means I, I got there. I made it in terms of a research lab. Um, however, um, I stopped caring and I stopped feeling like there was any meaning or purpose at the 60th or so paper that I wrote or co-wrote with my um, graduate students. If there are any graduate students here or just made it, you know, I loved your work. It was just my own sense of what I was doing and contributing that actually was missing. Um, and this wasn't about burnout. So I left academia or full-time academia anyway. I still do science about half, 50% uh, of my time uh, funded very generously for the, from the Templeton Foundation, but I'm no longer in that full-time academic context. And it wasn't because of burnout. It was about meaning and purpose and wanting to make an impact. Um, so I quit and went looking for this kind of shared purpose and thought partnerships, not thought leadership for me. Did, that didn't really ring well for me um, and opportunities for collection, uh, collective action. So you guys know, those of you in life itself right now, you see why I'm like glommed onto you and you're never going to get rid of me because there's a lot of shared sort of meeting that we have um, background wise. And what I was longing for was this real world impact, these non-hierarchical relationships as well to do this impact in. So mutually inspiring, authentic, multidimensional relationships I also wanted to do daily learning, which I basically do now in spades because I'm constantly wrong and being called out for it in these group, beautiful group contexts that support me. Um, and I basically wanted more play and serendipity, spontaneity, risk, rebellion. None of these things characterize academia for most of us who are at least in somewhat of these uh, contexts. So that's why I had left and instead, found some of what I'm looking for, I can finally say after three and a half years, in some incredibly lucky, fortuitous meeting of collectives of different sorts. So terrible kind of chilled out picture of us top left is Bloom Collective that I won't get into, but happy to share a little bit about um, at the end if anyone's interested, but it's just a group of people who met online who are very, very diverse, but somehow love being freaks together. Um, and we meet every year and more than that, uh, but at least every year in, in Provence to read poetry, plays, science, look at the stars, cook together, clean together, et cetera. Um, this is Gem Lab is my research group on the bottom left, and they are, have been my science enclave that I deeply love and still work with. And then on the right, you see the uh, some of the same members, some new members in the Liminal Learning co-founders. Two of the members are actually in the blue one, doesn't matter, just point is these are some of the representations of the collectives and some of the dead people that I deeply still love and feel like they're part of my collective as well that, that I read every day or almost every day that I still feel is sort of like my group. Um, and so now coming from this group, coming from all of the reading and coming from a very specific collaboration with Brian Cam, who is on this call. So he's going to answer any of the very hard questions that anyone has about this. I'm going to dive in direct, skip everything else and dive directly into a particular theoretical framework that I'm particularly excited about and uh, tell you a tiny bit about it enough so that you understand why we are using it as the foundation for liminal learning, which is a, um, just to give you a, a sense of it, it's, it's a retreat based, or at least that's where it starts as a retreat based or quest based um, launch into purpose-driven adulthood for young people who are going from teenagehood to adulthood. And it's a week-long land-based um, in the wilderness uh, experience that we then integrate with what I learned last year, week or the week before is this maps and rafts approach, right? So we give them both theory and practices to bring together. And that's what neither nor is also trying to do. So First and foremost, neither nor is going to be, is being developed as a book, okay? That's Brian's project, UFLA life work. But around the book, there's a constellation of other activities that support or continue to be, um, is a part of the book, but also activities outside of it. So first and foremost, neither nor is this 
original pragmatic philosophy um, that is based on millennia of work in the past, but also new thinking, bringing together past and current uh, thinkers across all sorts of disciplines. And it's a, it's a philosophy unto itself, but it is also a methodology by which we can do healthy inquiry towards, first of all, examining other philosophical, philosophical approaches, but also other disciplines and their contributions. Um, it is also a set of social experiments based on those same principles that we can use or that Brian develops by designing these crazy bots and other experiments um, to launch out into the world and then test the theory. And then finally, and what I'm gonna focus on today with our practices, it's a set of principles and practices for human flourishing, for personal suffering, to alleviate personal suffering and to help promote um, flourishing. Brian said it this way at his proposal that he got in an hour ago. The book is more than a call to action. It is an enacted call. And I love this kind of, it is it is action as it is a philosophy. And the principles that I wanna focus on, there are more, but the five that I wanna focus on now is the basis for liminal learning. The first is that there are essentially two modes of knowing, reason and intuition. You will all have your own lots and lots of great reading that you've done from other philosophers and scientists and, and thinkers who have similar modes of knowing that they have uh, elaborated on. This could be an entire talk on just that. I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, these two modes of knowing are really important to dif differentiate and to be able to, the second uh, principle is to cultivate flex flexible movement between these ways of knowing, these polarities, or any polarities, actually. Uh, but it, in particular, one of them is the ability to, to move from conceptual understanding, logical understanding, left brain understanding, for those of us who are doing that um, research call, and more the right brain intuitive, experiential embodied, right? The third is that there's learning that requires, sorry, all learning requires trial and error, experimentation variation and selection, right? That's partially what we're gonna do in the actual uh, activity we do. Um, all philosophies and concepts are social. So they are, they emerge in social contexts, they're contextually embedded, and they also get developed in that context. So nothing can be pulled out, no concept can be pulled out without its social history uh, being considered. And then the fifth one that I wanna focus on here is that experience, is essential for meaning, purpose, and knowing in general. It is an essential way of, it's the pinnacle way of moving our knowing forward. Um, and that's what we're gonna jump into very soon. So what we do at Liminal Learning is we get young people at this key developmental transition, the adolescence to adulthood, mm -hmm. right? There's also, they are embedded in a world uh, transition, which is what you all call the second renaissance, what other people are calling metacrisis, polycrisis, you all know what I'm talking about, if at least you're, if you're at life itself, but also other people know um, what I'm talking about. Those are the general two main transition points, one embedded within the other, right? And the first premise that we have at Liminal Learning is that we want the same neither nor principles and practices can be cultivate, can cultivate flexibility to help us navigate both those transitions. The second premise is that specifically applying flexibility practices to personal stories alleviate suffering. So we're walking all around with personal stories that most young people have never considered are constraining their lives. I know most people here have practices and they know this from decades of, of meditation, but this is what we're actually giving young people um, oftentimes a first glance, uh, glimpse into. And that the third premise then is that the same flexibility uh, practices can be applied to societal stories and dogma and can help address global uh, crises, potentially. Okay, so um, that's neither nor. There's also, I want to just say, a sh ton of data that suggests that our personal suffering comes from rigidity in our personal stories and the fact that they we don't update them. I can give anybody these uh, slides so nobody has to be writing down free. Uh, feverishly, but there's lots of good psychological science that says we need to learn that these abstractions are not reality and that we can change and replace our stories so that they're more useful for our flourishing. Um, 
part of the way that we can change those stories is to think through our values. So we think we come up with our values from hard thinking and learning and reflection, but actually um, there's lots of social scientists who have talked about values as a reflection of our actions, our experience, our lived everyday moments. And our actions are always determined by an amazing complex array of emergent influences that put our values in tensions between each other. But most of us have gone to corporate shit or other workshops or what, sorry, I shouldn't say shit. They're well-intentioned experiences that help us go into workshop experience and we identify a set of values that we believe in. Most of those times, those values are suggested as boxes, as static entities for which we want to aspire towards at best. And they're very uh, seldom thought about as tensions that we navigate through an entire complex network of, of values. So hold that thought. And I just want to say that there are loads of people, some of the books are here, uh, Novogratz, but other people who talk about moral imagination as exactly this idea that in order to change societal and global stories, we need moral imagination and moral imagination holds that we must have these uh, we have to hold opposing values in tension. We will meet people from different cultures with different stories, with different values, and those are going to be in tension with ours. And the only way to move forward globally is to hold those tensions and stay rest in that resistance to collapse. So liminal learning at the bottom there, um, we first practice on our own personal stories, and then we resist collapsing into static categories in that context. And then we do this hopefully in a collective context, trying to go out into the world and do this, right? So these, I should skip this. I'm just saying here that the personal stories are embedded in social context that we can then use social practices to move around our narratives and move around our personal stories. And by that, we get empowered to realize, holy shit, we could actually change a whole lot more. And that's the idea. This in between here under storytelling, these are actual processes and mechanisms that we've identified in our own research helps young people shift their stories and they map onto perfectly to the neither nor principles that uh, and practices. So things like um, grappling with contradictions, attentive listeners and so on. Okay. Oh my God, the time gone way, way faster. Okay, let's go into Jesus. Um, okay, so here are the val here are values and tensions. And what I'm going to ask you to do is go through these values and um, and think about a transition period in your life. Think about a turning point in your life. And in the next one minute, do not think deeply about this. What I want I'm going to give you back the the tensions in a second. Um, for each tension, just mark where you're at in the experience when you went through that tension, not what you hope you were at, right? So I'm gonna give it back to you. And what you can do is take a screenshot if you like, and just quickly, without thinking too much about what those values are, where did you land on these? I completely didn't realize that I just went on for half an hour. I went into a fugue state. You guys need a practice. It's, it's not been half an hour, Isabella, don't worry. I'm keeping, I'm keeping an eye. We can always slightly reduce the breakout rooms timing, so don't worry. Okay. 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 I'm going to give you a minute for this. Once you've done that, you can, sorry, I should say that you can also fill in your own if these are not relevant or only some of them are relevant. You can also change the polarity, the words of the polarities if you feel that the, some of the words are not the polarities that fit with your transition period. That often happens as well. And you don't have to have it all figured out yet because in conversation, it might start um, emerging more clearly. What I'd like to do now is get you all into breakout rooms. Mostly it should be two people if we've got it right. And 
yeah, it's 18 people. Oh, but I'm not going to do one. So, so you might be in a group with three, but generally you'll be in, in a group with two. Everybody's got the screenshot. You can also take a screenshot of this one, which has the further uh, instructions. You're going to go into your breakout rooms and then one person will take two minutes to tell their entire um, uh, story of their transition point. And this transition point can be something like, I don't know, I the a birth of a new sibling, or it could be pretty serious, like a divorce, or it could be a breakup, or it could be a death of a loved one, but it also could be the first time you learn how to ride a bike. So any kind of transition that you think of is, er, especially if it's an early developmental one, it would be most useful for this exercise. And you're going to tell that story to your partner for two minutes, go through it all the way, and then tell that then discuss that story in light of these tensions. In light of those tensions, how does the story uh, exemplify your level of in independence, for example, versus dependence? In light of your story, how much trust or uncertainty did you feel in that story? And then once you're done that, or during that uh, time that you're talking about that, your partner can ask you questions especially if they're unclear or they think maybe they could move you on this tension, um, this, this continuum. So the discussion from your partner is there to, to deepen your understanding of that polarity and potentially change you on some of these polarities and spend that three minutes with that, that extra three minutes of questioning from your partner to change uh, if you wanted you know, where you'd land on these tensions and then switch. So this is, going to be, I don't know how quickly we can do this because you should have at least five minutes each. Can That's we fine. That? We, can do, we can do, yeah, we can do 10 minutes. That's no problem. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to open the- Is everything rooms. clear? Just to make sure that there's no yeah. questions. All right. And the screenshot should help you remember the things. All right. And I've put stuff in the chat as well if anyone wants to copy and paste. Okay, so I'm going to open the rooms now. You have 10 minutes. We'll be back at 10 past. Welcome back, all. Um, so I would love to hear. We've got a chance right now to take about five minutes now that I've totally chilled out and realized we weren't stopping at the top of the hour and I went into a completely whack. We have about five minutes to talk about your experience in that um, sharing your stories of transition points. And I'd love to hear what that was like for you, if there was anything that came up for you that was particularly interesting, if you learned something, anything actually. You can also drop some comments in the chat and I can highlight them in the in between of our conversation if you prefer that way. Does anybody want to share? Just unmute yourself and jump in. Hello. Hey. Just uh, a conversation we had based on the exercise. Maybe it wasn't directly related to it, but we talked about wholeness and diverse parts. And a thought came to mind of like, is the, part, the way to wholeness through fragmentation? The sort of if you first inhabit a singular part and you find a coherence in that. And the moment you step out of that, you enter a sense of fragmentation. Maybe you enter like this realm of diverse parts, but they don't fall, form a whole new whole yet. But maybe they are. This is actually the way to wholeness. Yeah, that's just a thought. <laughs> mm, thank you. And did that thought just out of, uh, just to push it a little further, did it come through sharing your experience of your transition point. Boaz, just so you know, everybody just went and had a conversation about their transition, a transition point in their own development and uh, talked about it in reference to tensions and values, basically. Um, and so was this something that emerged from your uh, discussion or something that just went, you went deeper conceptually into it? Yeah, we, we had this conversation after we both shared our experiences. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think this aligns with my personal experience experience in, uh, yeah, my, my changing my shit myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Anyone else in terms of 
what you shared, what was interesting to hear about people's experience of a transition in their lives. We uh, we can. I'll, I'll add one. I just um I was surprised that the example that came to mind for me was precisely one in which I would say my standard readout or categories at that time was suspended. Um, and so yeah, it really stood out as a transition period where actually precisely because I was noticing big swings in uh, along some of those spectra. So. Mm. Oh, that yeah. is interesting. Thanks. Mm. Anyone else? By the way, I'm very used to holding space that keeps lots of uh, silence for the moments where it's some somebody's called to talk. And I think it's actually really important and lovely to do that. So you can rest in it as well and see if you're called to speak in the next couple of minutes. Of course, there's never going to be silence with my stupid cat. One one thing I noticed was um, it's it was sometimes challenging to put just kind of a marker down on the transition because you really needed some of both during certain periods of the transition. And the other thing I noticed was when I was describing um, a big life transition that was challenging, um, there was kind of a recognition that under high stress, I tended toward one side of the spectrum and then over time as i acclimated to the transition there's just in the telling recognize the kind of this shift toward the other end of the spectrum like the one that came to mind was under stress i go intellectual and then as i acclimate i open up to intuition really interesting and there, that's a question I had for everyone in some ways. So it's like um, you did a beautiful bridge for us uh, there. To what extent do you think in these transition moments um, that the distinction between intuition and reason is helpful for you? And how, if that's the case? Hi, Rufus. I didn't see you. Have you been here the whole time? No, I had to. Child care duties brought me in and out, but I have been here some of the time. Okay, we're reaching time on the discussion, Isabella. But... Yeah. Any, any other thoughts that anyone wants to throw in, either from what I discussed before or the transition exercise for now? Yeah, so Martin says that his reason and intuition melt into each other, and his reason is massively influenced by intuition normally. That sounds like a very integrated <laughs> sense of self, which is great. Thank you. I'm, I'm just thinking also, well, is it, is it better about um, rationality that comes through dialogue? Yes. The rationality seems to be this, yeah, Um uh, yeah, uh, uh, dependent on or, 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 or very much scaffolded through, of course, internal discussions, if you can do the uh, internal voices, but uh, otherwise, how how general or how necessary uh, interpersonal dialogue is to, to, to find rationality. Yeah, really good point. So you mean in in discussion, there is a structure that's almost called for so that you are legible for the other person or you're creating it with the other person? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I have that feeling too. Any other final thoughts for this? <laughs> okay, so let's move now. We've got again, just to remind you a little bit, I'm going to uh, share my screen for a second. Um, what we're doing, what we're moving in and out of is this experience between, or not experience, but this uh, oscillation between 
I started with this kind of abstract sort of summary of some of the important principles of neither nor. I know I rushed through them, but we'll we'll go back to them as well at the end. Um, just presenting some of these ideas and trying to get them all in our own mind um, and the same sorts of definitions. And then um, in thinking about our own stories and our own abstract stories of our lives and so on, for us at Liminal Learning, it's really important to get these abstract ideas of change your story. All of this is, uh, you know, uh, relatively arbitrary. You can change how you think of your own life, but also how other people frame how society is working and so on by simply thinking about um, different uh, modes of, of knowing. So the activity here that I asked you to do was one that we have done with young people as well, where they thought about their own transition points and not just telling the story of it, because most people are used to telling some kind of story of when they change or then I realized sort of thing, but also thinking about moving the meaning of those, that experience through lived values and the, the, the changes in those potentially um, enacted values. So that's part of what we tried to do in that that experiential mode. Now I'm going back and summarizing this from you, uh, for you and just wanting to let you know that what we're doing in liminal learning also is that in the quests the, that are held in these local spaces in wildernesses around Canada at first, and then we're gonna go all over the uh, world. Um, we wanna get young people into their body, onto the land, into the world and sensing around them. Do you, you guys hear me? I just, yeah, okay. Um, sensing around them out of their regularly scheduled ruminations and so on, right? And these quests are iter iterative social experiments. So as they're canoeing and doing other things like, you know, just walking through nature, they're also thinking through constructing and reconstructing their personal stories that constrain them. Um, and we're helping them build new ones, and really they're helping each other mostly, um, and trying them on in the real world as they're talking. And just like Martin says, as they're trying to put them into another category and see how it works, uh, we're supporting them through that. Uh, and there are also creativity practices that are applied, um, which I definitely don't have uh, time to get into, but there's there an opportunity for them to explore all the ways that they are uh, being moved by the world around them and the people around them, and then how to kind of connect those stirrings into ways of acting in the world and then trying to execute some kind of project out into the real world that might have an impact based on this, the kinds of experiences they have. So um, after that, we have this post-activation launch into the ecosystem um, which means the world of, but but the ecosystem that we're hoping to develop and all of you are invited to please help us think through who can be part of this ecosystem. I know Limicon is gonna be a wonderful opportunity to find sort of allies in the world where the idea is that young people after leaving, uh, you know, this lovely, but also bubble of a place uh, of liminal learning can go into the real world and find others who are, likewise struggling with the same kind of questions, likewise practicing in ways that are mindful and developing wisdom practices communally with others. So definitely life itself will be one of the first places that we introduce these young people to, but I can imagine many of you are working on other projects that we hope to weave into the post, you know, quest launch of these young people. Um, and so what we're what we're calling this or what we're okay, I haven't actually talked to the rest of the co-founders about this yet, but OK, what I'm hoping we might be calling it is something like a heist. So the heist model we have talked about in our Bloom Collective, and this this is a really interesting idea, because instead of thinking about your career as you leave the liminal learning context or your entire life purpose or your, you know, meaning in life that you have to figure out. Really, it's about finding the questions that are most interesting to you and going on heists. So heists, as you all know, are things that are playful and temporary. They're time locked. There's lots of trial and error experimentation. And you find your people from the liminal learning group um, that you might have met. And you go out and try to have an impact on the world in the ways that you'd like to do, um, voluntarily rotating leadership 
um, and using this kind of dynamic set of tools that people can come into and may not have identified as their core self is, you know, an artist or a scientist and so on. So we're very excited about this idea of kind of launching them out of the quest and then they develop their own kind of heist to do some kind of social impact in the world and connect with you all in that world. Um, okay, sorry, wow, no, okay. So now, last but not least, I would like to add, to invite you to participate in the last um, practice that we have. You're gonna be asked for the last uh, seven minutes to link, do we have the link there, Denise? Of the, um, I don't actually have, the, it's easy to get, but do you have it? I can get it if you don't. Yeah, one second. Okay, so what you're gonna be asked to do is click on this link that's gonna be put in the group and you're gonna be asked a series of five questions. Don't think too long. Please don't try to be articulate. Please don't try to be poetic or, or like do anything beautiful. The idea is to just share your experience in reference to the question as fast as possible. And you'll have these, you know, seven, maybe 10 minutes. At that point, everyone will have answered the same questions. We will pr press a magical button, which is Denise. Um, and Denise will have collated all of our answers, all of our experiences into a book that will now leave you with another, after sharing your experience, another kind of conceptual hub, uh, a artifact that you can leave with from the wisdom of other people. So click on that, spend the next, can we, if you have 10 minutes, I think that would be ideal. And then we will give you the link to the collected book at the end of this call. All right, I know some of you will never finish, so I'm just gonna have to call it at some point. Um, I did wanna just wrap it up so we feel like there is a wrap up here that we wrote a little book together. This little collective is another kind of collective, right? Uh, and it just makes me happy <laughs> to do things together. Um, and uh, it's a summary of our collective learning, but so also culling from other people's experience is sort of just the greatest thing ever. And um, I'd highly recommend you follow Brian Cam's work. He's on Substack, but he's also, um, you can search for his work on, uh, in his podcast on Clear Story. It's called Clear Story, sorry. Um, really, if you if you look him up, Brian Cam, K-A-M, Brian is B-R-Y-A-N. Um, you'll find loads of these experiments that he shared on his podcast. Some of them are audio experiments in, in collective storytelling and sharing our experiences. Others are very specific to neither nor, and all of them are very connected to the kinds of experiences we're trying to build for liminal learners that are coming through and the larger community that we want to be a part of and want to invite you all to be a part. Well, we're basically feeling like I'm going to be a part of your collective um, you know, collectives, but, but you understand we're just we're doing the weaving and we keep weaving. So thank you really very much. Um, this is just one iteration as far as I'm concerned. Um, and we can keep going and we keep, can keep creating these kinds of artifacts as we learn together around practicing and then calling our information together. So I hope you all enjoy the, um, the actual uh, book and kind of find it fun to see what people's contributions are in your own in that woven fabric. Um, you just, you need to know that all of the photos are Denise's original photos. They are so beautiful. And it is really just another example of when you call in, you know, the boring scientist or whatever it is, and you work with artists and designers across these disciplines with philosophers and so on, there's something magical that happens. And so I hope you feel just a tiny bit of that with the book that you get. So thank you all for being here. I really, really appreciate the time here. Thank you so much, Isabella. Um, yeah, really, we really appreciate your time and your energy and the opportunity to have much more of, a, of an engaged um, contribution than, than some of the other community calls we have, have had. So thank you so much. And I think we probably definitely will take you up on um, doing this again in the future and we can sort of schedule a bit more time to really dive, dive into it a bit more.
Um, so I'm just going to, I'm a mindful we are over time by like 10 minutes. So if anybody wants to say any kind of like short parting words, you're welcome to unmute and do so now or type into the chat. <laughs> well, if no one has anything other than the many thank yous, then I will end this call and thank you all for showing up today. Um, and yeah, keep in touch. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks, Sarah.